uh, it made me indirectly think about things. And next thing I know, I've got long hair and I stopped shaving and I'm like, what am I doing? Yeah, but I could see you being just, you're now an author and, and you write, you know, science fiction or, or just, I, I think it works for you as well, so. I, th I, you know, it does or it doesn't. I, I think it does, I like it, you know. Again, it's, I, I, you know what, one thing that's come out of this also is I started to look at, <laughs> this is gonna sound maybe pretentious or crazy and that's okay, that's fine. Um, you are entitled to your opinions. Looking at my life as performance art, living my life as a performance art piece, not just being weird, like, oh, I'm going to grow my hair now, man. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm going to dye my eyebrows, baby. Like, not, not that way. Not that there's anything wrong with that. Because honestly, deep inside of me when I was a younger man, I really wanted to do that. I admired those folks, right? Um, Kate Bush is not a performance artist. But the first time I heard Kate Bush sing, mm -hmm. what is happening? blew my mind. First time I heard Al Jarreau start scatting, I was like, you know, still one of my favorite albums of all time is, is Al Jarreau live and in, in, uh, it was in 77, Look to the Rainbow. Unbelievable. Uh, but I didn't do it. I was too scared for whatever reason, right? Um, but yeah, I think that concept's really kind of beautiful and I like it and it's working for me right now so I'm going to keep doing more of that so if the long hair and the beard and uh, has precipitated me looking at things from a bigger perspective or start talking more about a business aspect or transmedia or living my life as a performance artist so be it so be it you know yeah. it's just interesting that you're you're cast as somebody that is really not who you are in, in a lot of ways, but, oh. but it, it seems to have, it, it's very convincing, but I can uh, tell that if just from being around you these, these few hours, yeah. that's not who no. you are, but no. you, you just really can't judge a book by its cover, because I, I would not have, if I saw you on the street, I would thought, you know, maybe you grew up in, in, in Missouri or Texas, or, I, you know, I would not have, yeah. have, you know, a Midwestern guy or whatever yeah. is from the South, yeah. and, and, just to think that there's a whole another world inside of you and that just is very interesting because we don't know about people walking around. Right, and, we and think that's we the know. most interesting thing. That's where, that's where all the juice is. That's where all the most beautiful stuff happens, right? I, I told you earlier, uh, so my father-in-law was a really great man, right? And um, I did an interview that, uh, that, that uh, in, in San Antonio and the, and the girl afterwards, they wanted to do, well, can we do a Facebook Live? Thing? Sure, great, let's do it. And she says, uh, so, you know, that must be really hard to, you know, you know, those are big shoes to fill. I'm like, well, first of all, I'm not a black man. I'm not a Christian. I'm not a minister. I'm not a PhD in mathematics, all of which my father-in-law was. And uh, so he is, he is he and I, I am I. I'm me, right? Mm -hmm. uh, second thing is, I'm not trying to fill his shoes, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So he's over here but I use it as motivation to keep going forward, right? On, on, his, uh, on his tombstone, he put down, I tried. That's what he wanted to have as his epitaph. I tried. I got it. <clears throat> excuse me. Wow. Right? Uh -huh. right? He certainly did try. And if he tried that hard, and, and what he and Uncle Martin did, in, in many ways, uh, allowed my folks to even get together, right? So in, in a very real way, I wouldn't even be here were it not for the Reverend and my mother-in-law Juanita and Uncle Martin and Aunt Coretta. I wouldn't even be here, right? So I'm not trying to fill their shoes. I'm just, I'm trying, man. I'm doing the best I can. Keep moving forward to, to do what I can do, right? In whatever, whatever way that's possible. So, um, I mean, I started to say this earlier, kind of all over the place, but uh, I decided that uh, I was going to try to be, you know, contribute and help and be of service. So I met some people and uh, there's this thing called Southern California Ceasefire and uh, it's for victims of gang violence. And we meet in uh, South, South Central uh, once a week and it's um, a place where everyone can get together and 
share their stories and their pain or what's going on or what kind of activity is going to be happening or if there's going to be a rally or if there's going to be a bake sale or a car wash or whatever. <clears throat> and of course, you know, someone lost their son or their father or their daughter or their mother. And uh, these are people with real problems. Yeah. These are people that are really suffering. They're not freaked out because, oh my God, did my audition go badly? Right. That puts things in perspective rapidly, right? You know, I said earlier that, um, so, I, so I, I go down there and I haven't been down there in, in a while, uh, but I do go and I do put myself in the middle of that. And it's an interesting mix because you've got the victims, families, and that's raw and that's palpable. And it's, um, I mean, I don't know what else to say about that. You've got LAPD there, plain clothes, and you've got a lot of undercover. You've got current gang members, and you've got old heads, as they call them, who are out of the game uh, and are trying to do best. In fact, they're the ones who started the whole thing. Oh, really? And uh, it's, it's, it's really interesting, and it really helps to keep perspective on things. And, uh, you know, if this white boy can go down there and talk and, and just eat, just, I didn't say anything for six or seven months. I just, hmm. what am I gonna say? What am I gonna say? Who am I to say anything? I'm just gonna listen to you. It's all I can do. I can listen. And that's, as an actor, by the way, listening is everything, right? You, you, I mean, some of the, if you, something I hear frequently, I mean, I've heard uh, Ben Kingsley say it, I've, I've heard Michael Caine say it, I've heard Helen Mirren say it, I've heard Meryl Streep say it, you know. Stillness, silence, and listening. If you focus on only those three things in your performance, everything will just start to blossom in ways that you could never have hoped for, beautifully, you know. It brings everything to life. So I was like, well, you know, I'll sit down and I'm going to listen because that's all I can do. And by the way, what am I going to say that would make me sound like the way I look? Like I was short hair, clean shaven those days, right? I look like the man, you know? Uh, so I just sat and listened, didn't say a word. <laughs> Funny. So Aunt Creta died. Uh, um, oh, I can't remember the year right now. It's been... It's been a minute, um, and I just had a surgery. I, I had a, a hip surgery, and I was like, Doc, I've got to fly. He's like, you can't fly. I'm like, I have got to go to her funeral. I cannot not be there. And so, you know, we got me on the medication, et cetera, and made sure I had plenty of painkillers and stuff. And so I'm hobbling along in just incredible pain, and I've got this, you know, my suit and tie on, and clean shave and short hair. And I want you to know the cops thought I was FBI. <laughs> Uncle Martin's attorney from back in the day during the movement comes up and goes, so uh, are you CIA or are you FBI? I don't think we've met before. I swear to God. And I'm hopped up on Vicodin. Mm -hmm. The pain's out of this world. I'm exhausted. You know, and, and by the way, that funeral service lasted like, I, le I had tapped out at the six hour mark. You know, Stevie Wonder was singing, and I had to get up and go back, and I sat back up in this upper room where all the cops were, and I was literally in a, a suit and tie <laughs> on the floor with my leg in the air, and the cops are walking by me. I, I just remember looking up, and there's guns and holsters and badges and bellies and hats. No one would have believed it. It was crazy. But, uh, yeah, yeah, they thought I was a cop. So I'm walking into a situation like South, Southern California ceasefire, with gang members, ex-gang members, old heads, LAPD, the victims, their families. Who the hell is that guy? What's that white boy doing here, right? And then as the word started to get out, oh, that's Abernathy's son, a husband. Oh, the, you know, then, oh, okay, oh, yeah. And then they start talking to me, and they're like, and they find out, oh, well, I'm half Iranian, you know, my name is really Daryush. I knew you weren't white. <laughs> I was like, I, I think I'm white. Like, no, man, you ain't white. You ain't white. Yeah, and then like that broke down all the distrust and the fear and the barriers. Uh, really interesting, man. And I and similarly, when when uh, when I was going through tough times, you know, the people that helped and listened to me the most were the women. 
Why do you think that is? I'll throw it back on you. Why do you think? Why would, why would you think? And I'll answer the question. I don't mean to be coy. Um, why would a woman listen better, be able to, more equipped to handle it? Well, typically we're sort of more the nurturers and the caregivers, but that doesn't mean men can't be as well, and it doesn't mean that women always are. But that's typically been our role, and that we're sort of taught to want to make sure everybody's okay. Um, I don't know. What, I realize that's an old stereotype, and I... I so, yeah, it is. I agree. And, and I, I never looked at it necessarily that way. Women, the female energy is, and here's a man talking about it, so forgive me, ladies, my perspective, you are much more in touch with your emotions than men are. Much more. From an early age. You look at a 10-year-old girl versus a 10-year-old boy. She's 10 going on 21, right? They understand social dynamics. They understand relationships, right? Those are critical things. By the way, they're critical in all aspects of life, and especially in this business, right? In any business, right? Relationships and in in walking emotional minefields. <laughs> we step in them quite often. Well, yeah. <laughs> everyone does, right? Uh -huh. Well, women, though, you know, they think about, you know, you talk to women, why did she do that? And they start breaking down the psychological reasons and the emotional things that may be going on. You talk to guys like, I don't know. <laughs> you know, they don't, they don't, we, like, we don't care. <laughs> until men to get hit, get, get, it seems to be until we hit like our mid 40s. And then there, if there's any hope, it happens right around there that you're going to start to understand. So I'd come and start talking about what was bothering me. My guy friend's like, yeah, cool. What's on TV? Right? And I was like, right. And I would just go back into, you know, open mouth breather, knuckle dragging, you know. Let's drink a beer mode, right? Now, if I talk to a girlfriend, she'd lean into me, you know. Oh, wow. And I'm like, shit, she's listening to me, <laughs> right? Like, wow. Oh, my God, that must have been terrible. Or, oh, wow, you're so brave to do that. Or whatever it was, right? And just in listening and being empathetic, which that feminine energy has in a more beautiful way than men, men do. Even though I sat here and talked about my father-in-law and Martin, you know, who certainly had it, but it was still masculine. You know, there's just a beautiful thing there. So anyway, because of that, I decided I was going to go down to the Downtown Women's Center uh, in L.A. <laughs> and similarly, that didn't work out so well either because I, I kind of got pulled aside. And, uh, well, I didn't get pulled aside, but I noticed that the women were like, there was, they just, there was this visceral stay away from me thing. Sure. Yeah. And I was a little bit older than, it seemed to be like a lot of younger kids were there and stuff, but. Um, yeah. Happens. It and happens. it's understandable. Sure. They've I think been it's through the ringer. Yeah. They've been through the ringer. I was like, okay, well, that's not the way I'm going to be able to serve that situation. I got to find another way. So 